Welcome to the Christian Family Centre. Whether you're online, in person, or this is your first time with us, we hope you feel welcomed and enjoy being with us for one of our weekend services. Let us know you're here today by filling out a Connect card that's on your seat or by scanning our QR code to fill out online. Good morning, everyone. Joy to share with you what is called the Psalm of the Cross, uh, Psalm 22, a magnificent uh, statement. Um, Amazing, amazing psalm. It's the most quoted psalm of the New Testament. And uh, it's found right throughout the Gospels and the letters. And Psalm 22, when we read, and we'll read it together in a few moments, is a prayer of King David. It actually, it's a prayer while he's experiencing deep, deep, deep anguish. I mean, it's, it's painful to read uh, some of the statements he says. He's really suffering and he's being victimized by some pretty vicious enemies. And what's so unfair and unjust is that David hasn't provoked them at all. And what's even worse, it seems that God's a million miles away initially. And uh, so he pours out his heart uh, to the Lord. And, um, but something fantastic takes place as, as he's praying, as he's writing. And somehow God's Holy Spirit comes on him and he starts to write things about Jesus and the suffering Messiah who's going to be the sovereign Lord of all, the son of David, the greater David. And God promised that there would be a king forever over Israel. And uh, the spiritual Israel today is of course the church of Jesus Christ. And so it, it's, it's fantastic and very prophetic. And uh, as David expresses, his personally distressing time. He receives what we say spiritual revelation, insight. Whether he fully understood that he's referring to to, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Um, he knew about the, the, the prophetic word that came through him that there will always be a king over Israel, but I think David probably thought it's gonna be a physical king over a physical kingdom. Maybe he had some insight into that it would be an eternal an eternal kingdom, but at times the Old Testament prophets are a bit confused. I think David probably is, is clearer than most of them that there's something happening that's gonna take place that's glorious, that's amazing. And he, he expresses this in this psalm. So he affirms the prophesied Messiah's victory, his sovereignty. And it moves David from a, a period of, of in, in, the, in the song, in the psalm, of great suffering to great joy. You see that coming through, breaking through. And uh, as I said, it's the most quoted and alluded to psalm in the New Testament. And it accurately and poignantly describes Jesus' passion, what took place in Gethsemane and on the cross, and, uh, and what's gonna result from his suffering on our behalf to secure our salvation. So I've called the, 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 the title of my message, I couldn't find one word. I should have said the Psalm of the Cross, but I've got here, Jesus shines as our suffering, saving, sovereign Messiah. Um, three S's, I'm trying to be smart. No, it's just kind of like, I just see, you see his suffering, you see his saving grace, you see how sovereign he is over all things. So as we read Psalm 22, I'm gonna make some comments. We're gonna read the whole lot in uh, uh, the three different translations I've put together because I'm not satisfied with one. NIV, NLT, New Living Translation, and also the message, just just beautiful statements. But as we read, I want us to pause. Remember the word selah I mentioned last week? It actually says pause, stop, think, reflect apply what God is saying. And maybe with what I'm gonna share with you, there'll be like a prophetic word that's gonna be just for you in this early New Year period. That's gonna kind of say, oh, that's God speaking 
to me today through his word. Uh, I said to uh, Kathy or someone, you know, this is my 46th year of preaching here at the Christian Family Center. I want another 46 years. God, give them to me. Do you think he's gonna answer that prayer? No, I don't think so. Um, but uh, there's a sunset clause on my life and on all our lives and certainly in my leadership of the church. But I'm just so thrilled that I'm able to share God's word and to gain insights that the more I, I actually read the scripture, the more I reflect on the scripture, the more I pray over the scripture as I'm reading it with pen in hand and reckon my Bible as I put down things, I just think, I'm just blown away. I, I, just get, I get so excited and I, I get so thankful of how God, how good God is to us that he's given us his word to guide us. It's a lamp to our feet. And as we meditate on it, and as we reflect on it, it strengthens us, it builds us up, it secures us. And this is a, a magnificent one. So I've listed some of the times the New Testament authors quote or reference this magnificent psalm. So I've got the New Testament scripture down there. If some of you want that, let Pastor Nathan know, he'll send it to you by email if you wanna do your own study as well. And uh, so he starts off by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken and abandoned me? As I was reading the uh, Treasury of David, which is uh, the greatest exposition of the Psalms ever by, by um, Charles Spurgeon, you've got to believe it, it's like 1,500 pages and he just opens up the Psalms and uh, he calls this one the Psalm of the Cross. And as, as he uh, shares, he actually thinks that Jesus may have been quoting the whole Psalm. So we just don't know, the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, 40 years after the events, record bits and pieces of what Jesus said, okay, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the great Spurgeon says, he thinks that this was so, so, such an important psalm for Jesus, that he may, be, may have been quoting it and referring to it because he's actually going through it. The prophetic word is now coming to pass through his passion, through his death on the cross. And, uh, and he, hang, he, he, he quotes this while he's hanging on a cross, folks, carrying the burden of your sin and my sin upon himself. It wasn't a cry of unbelief, of doubt. It was just a heartfelt appeal to his Father in heaven. It was a cry of, I love you, Father. This is painful to be separate from you, to become sin knowing that you cannot look on sin and I'm gonna become sin so that sinful people who have lived independently of, of you and who have, who have done stuff that opposes your will and grace, that they can be forgiven, that they can be saved. And um, he takes, so it, it's a heartfelt appeal to, to the Father of uh, saying, God, I don't, I'm in pain and he was in pain, and, and yet he willingly went to the cross. He embraced the suffering because he knew that you would experience salvation one day and be rejoicing and worshiping him 2,000 years later. Um, he goes on to say, and, and Mark quotes this, why are you so far from me, from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish, you can feel his pain. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but, but I find no rest. Yet, and notice a little bit of hope comes through. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And Mark quotes this in his gospel. And then Paul in Romans 9.33, he quotes this one. In you our ancestors put their trust. You know, from Abraham all the way down to now. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. So he, he's reminding God of saying, you came through for them and in you they trusted and were not put to shame. And Paul takes this statement and, and applies it in his wonderful letter to the Romans. And in Matthew 16, we find this quoted, but he says, but I'm a worm. This is David, I mean, this is pretty awful, but I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone despised by the people, to come to a place where you, you see yourself as a worm and uh, 
You know, you, it's awful. And, and when people despise us and heap scorn on us, they treat us less than human. And like David, we may feel like worms. And some of you may have experienced that. And, and, and you know, when you feel the poisonous sting of rejection, keep in mind, you've got to keep in mind the hope and the victory God promises us through our faith in Jesus Christ. I think rejection is probably one of the worst pains, probably is the worst pain that a person can experience. Um, you know, rejection by a spouse, rejection by a family member, a friend. Um, I've seen it up close and the pain is, it causes is awful. Um, you know, I particularly grieve over older women who are abandoned and rejected by their husbands after decades of marriage, and particularly when they chase after somebody younger. And the, the pain they experience, it's just awful. There's nothing, there's nothing worse than to be rejected by the person you love and that you've sown your life into. And uh, it's very cruel. He goes on to say, the psalmist, all who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. And Matthew quotes this. And I, I find it very painful as a shepherd, as a spiritual leader. Um, and I know my fellow pastors and leaders right across our denominational family at times, they, they really feel the pain when they're rejected by people that they've invested a big time, big time into and have loved uh, deeply. And I've had uh, to help pastors in our denominational family in, in my role, as, as for those who don't know, I head our denominational family and, and try and be a support and help to pastors. And I tell you, it's awful when they want to quit because they're discouraged, uh, because they've invested time and energy and then for whatever reason, uh, people turn and, uh, and hurt them by rejecting them or, or saying things that are, that are not sound or good or true. I think also of, of uh, in our society, I think of long-suffering teachers and principals handling disgruntled parents. Yeah. I mean, the number one job where people quit today are school principals. Yeah. We've had more school principals quit because parents come and beat them up. Could you believe it? Or yelling abuse at them. Uh, children, te teenagers will assault them. So the, the levels of nervous breakdowns and people that quit, I mean, you just think, beautiful teachers and principals who sow their lives into educating our children. Boy, do they feel rejection at times. And they say, I'm done with teaching. Never want to be in a classroom again. Awful. Medical staff, nurses, doctors, with ungrateful patients and strung out family members. Most of our hospitals now have security everywhere. Because you've got people coming in and they'll beat up a nurse. You talk to my wife who's been a nurse for 30 years and the situation she's had to deal with, she's been hit. And uh, our nurses, our doctors, um, you know, some of it is families under terrible stress and not knowing how to handle when someone is really, and so they just, they go off. But others is because they could be inebriated or they just could have a, a mentality, an entitlement mentality that they expect this and that and not realising the medical people and the, the nursing staff are there to help us. And I'm just so thankful for them. I mean, and some of the poor nurses and, and staff, you know, we know of situations where a person is of another ethnicity and a person will say, no, not that person. I want the white fella. Awful. You know, I know of that. I know that that's happened. And... Um, and uh, it's just ugly. I remember when Kathy was in hospital for 20 days in uh, 2023, most of the nurses were Filipinos. I love Filipino nurses. They are so happy, they're always smiling, they always are giving. And uh, there, there, there were others too, Nepalese and Indians and, and, and a whole pile of different people. And I just think, they're fantastic. But to have somebody so I don't want that person because they're black or they're Asian. I mean, I, I just find that unbelievable. But they, nurses have to put up with that. I shared this at the 8.30 service and one of our dear ladies said, I've experienced it myself and it's awful. And she nearly cried, she's out the door. She said, I've experienced it. And uh, where 
You know, I was rejected because of the colour of my skin. I just find that unbelievable. Um, public servants being abused by, by, again, entitled people. Now, we know the public service at times can be very slow. It's very sure, but it's very slow. But I tell you, what they put up with is terrible. And uh, you think of tradesmen and women, you know, accused of poor workmanship when they've done a good job so the person doesn't have to pay. And if they take them to court or to tribunal, it's going to cost time and energy, and they just give out, okay, the $3,000 job, you pay $1,500. I've seen that it's happened here. We had a tradesperson who, who did a, a job for a, a, a person who was, we discovered was not a very honest and honourable person, and they didn't want to pay them. So uh, it went to a tribunal, and uh, the, the tradesman said, should I take it to court? I said, yes. I said, this is, this is important. I said, you, you know, is the job, get someone to inspect it. They inspected it. But the person didn't cooperate. And that person was part of the church. And, and in those days, we had a minister of excommunication. His name was Ian Hunter. And he used to deal with those people. Not me. I had clean hands. He, he did it all. <laughs> you know, because there's, when you think of, to abuse the kindness of people and, and not to do what's right. Uh, th th there's rules of relationship within the kingdom of God as well as within society. And we say, well, look, you, this ain't the place for you, sorry. You know, like, you, this is, you know, you've got to pay, you've got to do the right thing. But look, rejection. And I know that, trades, that tradesman was really hurt. <laughs> he did a really good job. So you may be in that situation where you've experienced terrible rejection. Sadly, this is the cruel aspect of life. And we all have to deal with it. But we've got to learn not to react to it and become embittered. We've got to respond to Jesus and become better people through it without resentment, without bitterness towards those who have hurt us. We may not agree with them. And, and, and certainly, uh, you know, relationships can be, can be broken. But you've got to forgive them just as Jesus did on the cross when he said, Father, Forgive them. These are murderers. People are murdering him. They're being cruel. And he, he's thinking of, of them and he's thinking of us. And he found something that he could appeal to the Father on. He says, ah, just forgive them because they're, they're just dumb. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They put him on the cross, but really it was our sins, your sins and my sins, that put him on that cross so he could carry those so that we could receive the salvation and forgiveness that God brings through the shedding of Christ's blood on our behalf. And as we turn from ourselves and put our trust in him as a resurrected savior, we experience saving grace, forgiveness, new life, peace with God. Amazing, wonderful. So, he says in, he goes on to say, he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. This is like reading the Gospels. This is why Spurgeon called it the Psalm of the Cross. Matthew quotes this. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. Notice now how he's now kind of thinking, but God, you're sovereign. And it's like, I'm not an accident. You knew me from birth. I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You've been my God. See, God's loving concern for you doesn't begin when you receive Jesus as your saviour. Okay? It reaches back to the days before you were born and it reaches ahead to the unending path of eternity. Amen. His amazing love. You're not an accident. You were in our heavenly Father's heart before you were even a twinkle in your daddy's eye. I love what Paul says, and, and I, I love the translation of the message in this in Ephesians 1. He says this, how blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He is the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him, long before he laid down earth's foundations. Do you get this? Before he created the earth, 
He had you in mind, had settled on you as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. I mean, like, before the earth was made, like, intellectually, cognitively, it's really hard to grasp. Before God made the earth, before he made Adam and Eve, our first parents, he knew you. What? And he knew that our first parents would fall into sin and that human beings would turn their backs on him and his good government and you know, sin came in, which is S-I, big I, independence of God. They, they, people declared their independence from him rather than being in a state of dependence. And it says, Paul says, and it's, the scripture says, he knew your name, he knew who you were before even the earth was made. Do you understand that? Because I don't. I don't get it, but I accept it. And it thrills me to think, wow, I'm known. I'm not an accident. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm meant to be here. I'm meant to be here. Wow, this is amazing. And he goes, what pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Wow. You might be thinking, but you know, my, I'm just an accident because you know, my, my mum had a um, miscarriage before I was born, which so many women do. Then a child comes along and you might think, oh, well, I, you know, just luck. No, it's not. God sovereignly planned and you, you were the one. Okay, we don't understand it, but we accept it to say, you know what, I, I, have, absol- I have value and worth because of the foreknowledge of God. There will never be another you. There was a song that was sung on that, wasn't it, in the 1960s? Who remembers that one? What was the song? Who sang it? The Seekers, Judith Durham, of course. Hey, that shows how old we are. Do you want me to sing it? The big no from the front row. Okay, I better be careful, yeah. And he goes on, he says here, don't be far from me, for trouble is near. There's no one to help. He's saying, really, really, it's only God. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls, fierce bulls of Basham. And the Basham was an area of Palestine that was particularly green and luscious. And so the bulls were really big. They were really big and fat and big horns and, and, uh, and they've hemmed me in. Can you imagine that? A whole bunch of bulls snorting their legs and, and surrounding him and he's in the middle. That's, that's the, the metaphor he uses. And then he says, lions with great big jaws are ready to snap me up. He's pretty imaginative in his distress and uh, they're roaring, tearing into their prey. And he goes, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt. What's that? It's unbaked clay. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. He's in a pretty bad way, emotionally. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They've pierced my hands and feet. Luke and John refer to this. All my bones are on display. What's he saying? Because I haven't got a stitch on. No socks, no shoes, no pants. People can see every part of me. I stare and they gloat over me. Then they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. It's like he's referring to Jesus in the midst of his own pain and suffering and distress. It's such a, a terribly gross insult to rob a person of everything, uh, even their clothing. Um, you know, if you've ever had your house broken into, and certainly Kath, Kath and I have, <laughs> and uh, not our present place, that's secured. We've got lions and bears and guard dogs and <laughs> men with weapons and ready, no one would try. Anyway, but when they, they broke in, I mean, you feel absolutely naked to go 
through your drawers where your undies are to try and find you. I mean, like, hey, that's private, thank you. You know, <laughs> it's like, and to, to steal jewelry and to steal stuff and, and, and your home's your castle. And to actually break in and steal, I, I felt absolutely outraged by it. I thought the indignity of it all uh, is awful. But here he says that they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for, for my garment, leaving them, you know. And, and one of the most shocking uh, films you could see uh, of the Second World War or video, you know, sort of documentaries is, is when the Nazis came in and invaded the Ukraine and uh, the Soviet Union then, and uh, uh, Lithuania and the Baltic states, and, and Hitler gave an order. He didn't do this for the French, or he says, I don't care who you kill, kill them all. That's what he said to his generals. A lot of the generals didn't obey. And he'd written in Mein Kampf, I want to eliminate 100 million Slavs I want the land from the Ural Mountains right through to Berlin. That's gonna be the Labestrum, the, 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 the breeding ground for all the Germans. We're gonna have a thousand year rake. He's, 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 he's demonic. He was Satan personified. And to see, in three days, they, they shot 30,000 Jewish men, women, and children, and babies. You see mothers holding their babies as they're being shot, the bullet goes through them and the child. And what's worse is they strip them naked and have them running towards the pit and they line up on the pit and they shoot them. And you see these poor dear souls covering themselves as they're going to their deaths. What humiliation. What psychological, demonic evil that is. And then to murder them as they're smoking and drinking and carrying on. To show you the evil, when Himmler... Heinrich Himmler went to observe the shootings. So many of those German boys were so disturbed having breakdowns that they became alcoholics or they couldn't handle the killings. That's when they came up with the final solution. So nobody touches them. Just gas them and burn them and no one actually does anything because of the, the torment and the terror that it brought upon those young 18 to 25 year old young men who had to be indoctrinated and filled with hatred to do it. Even then, they could, it was disturbing them. Evil. I only say that because when you see the film, and, and I don't recommend you see it, but when you do, it just shocks you to think, how could you do that? Dignified, beautiful, older, older men and older women having to run naked to, to the, and then line up on the pit and then they shoot them and down they go. Jesus experienced that kind of humiliation, terrible humiliation. He identifies with the, the deepest levels of suffering and inhumanity and cruelty that people inflict on each other. He allowed himself to go through that so that he can identify with all the terrible things that take place in our world. He carried the sins of, of, of the world and he was humiliated. You know, the, when they started painting Jesus in the Middle Ages, the artists, they couldn't get themselves to, to, to paint him naked or on a cross. They had to put a loincloth there. There was no loincloth. Romans never did that. So he's being jeered, he's being ridiculed. His mum, his sisters, uh, the women that are there. And um, to punish them even further, it was a, a humiliating experience for Jesus. Crucified naked before a jeering crowd so that we could be free from shame and fear and guilt. He carried that all. And now he gives us the greatest sense of dignity and self-worth and says, I love you, you have value. I did this for you. I went through this so that you don't have to go through it. And the writer of Hebrews, he quotes this past portion. He goes, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You're my strength. Come quickly to help me. I love this. Because you're not far from me. So you see how he changes the tone from, where are you? You're not far from me. You're my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword. Pry precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. So he's going, 
when I get to church, I'm gonna praise you. Church then was the temple. So he says, I've got to testify of how good you are. I'm gonna proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. Our public experience, sorry, our personal experience of Jesus saving grace deserves a public testimony. You've personally experienced his saving grace. And you're here today, and this is a public testimony. For those of us that have been around for a long time, if you're visiting here, if you maybe haven't crossed over the line of faith and you're still investigating and checking out Jesus or whether you're online, we're here to testify. We're publicly saying, God is good, Jesus is alive, he died on a cross for our sins, he rose again, sent the Holy Spirit, and you can come to new life and experience the liberation of forgiveness of all your sins, guilt, fear, and shame. It gives you peace with God and the gift of eternal life where you'll live forever and ever. And he assures you with that by giving you a deposit of what's gonna come, the Holy Spirit, who keeps reinforcing this to us. Wow. We praise him and we affirm. Look at every song that was sung today. Every prayer that's been prayed. I don't know if you noticed that. We just sing and just don't think. I sing and I think. Some songs I I listen, I go, what was that about? That's a strange word. (laughs) I like songs that testify. They testified of Jesus. My message today, this is a public testimony. And the aim is that really, uh, this is like our staff meeting. This is like, this church service is like our staff meeting so that it is to empower you and to encourage you and to inspire you to go out this week and be a personal witness. Testify of who Jesus is. Witness to people, win them over. Don't try and win with arguments. Win with kindness, win with love, win with knowing that they should know that you're a credible person. You can't witness if you're not credible. If you're terrible at work, if no student at university likes you because you're mean, well, you're not gonna be a good witness. So you gotta get the meanness out and the awfulness out and let Christ in and be changed by him so they can see how different you are. Then when you speak, they say, ah, okay. So this is our, 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 our public witness, our public testimony here at church, Friday morning, 8.30, 10.30, 5.30 to 9 so that you can go out and be an effective witness throughout the week. The writer of Hebrews again quotes the Psalm. He goes, praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honour him, all you descendants of Jacob. So he's actually saying, Jacob, whose other name is Israel, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He says, he says show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. And we are the spiritual Israel now. Because David's greatest son, Jesus, became the head of his church, which is the spiritual Israel throughout the world. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He will never belittle you. He will never ignore you in your times of suffering. You might be suffering, but you ain't alone. Others may belittle you. You may belittle yourself. You may feel like a worm, but he will never, his spirit is there to lift you up and to encourage you. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. And he listens to your cries for help. That's what David says here. And he's turning, you can see, from from this abject hopelessness almost to, to now finding hopefulness in his faith in God. Folks, we have a compassionate and a merciful saviour in heaven who's always attuned to your cries and, and, just, and he just loves to meet needs and whatever you're going through today, maybe you had a really difficult year last year and you're saying, oh, I want this year to be a more hopeful, helpful year or you might be going through some stuff now. We'll pray for you at the end of the service. The Lord is here to help you by his Holy Spirit. He can give you hope, he can help you and encourage you. Be prayed for, be strengthened in his name. This is our our time together here. He goes, I will praise you in the assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. 
The poor will eat and be satisfied. I love that. The spiritual poor. You might be spiritually poor, emotionally poor, relationally poor, financially poor. There may be poverty, but he says, eat of Jesus. Trust him. Like I said last week when I shared on Psalm 2, kiss the son and live. An intimate term. In other words, to kiss a person means you're being, you're being intimate and you're close to them. Here he's saying, eat, kiss him, eat him, and you will be satisfied. Imbibe him. And what they're saying is be intimate with him. Let him be intimate with you. Imbibe him into your life, like as you eat and, and drink, and, uh, and, and, and you will be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. How's that? When you seek him. Because if you're seeking him, you're looking for an answer. They end up praising him. We're like, wow, I found the answer. Hearts rejoice with everlasting joy. This psalm is probably the greatest statement of the worldwide nature of the universal church of Jesus Christ. There's, it contains, a, you know, there's no psalm or prophecy that contains a grander vision of grateful worshippers from across the globe who wholeheartedly join in thankfulness to God the Father for sending his son Jesus Christ as the saviour of the world, the Messiah. Listen to these words. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. How's that? All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For royal power, dominion, belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. Prime ministers and presidents and governments don't rule the nations. They're all gonna die. They're all gonna pass away. Only he who does the will of God is gonna live forever. Jesus is on the throne. These petty dictators and malign governments come and go. They, they cause terrible evil. And sometimes we have to fight them. Like in the Second World War, they had to fight this monster, Hitler. They had to fight that monster, Tojo, in Japan. They had to fight that monster, Mussolini. These were evil people that had marshaled millions of people. Do you know how many million people Hitler unleashed on the Slavic peoples of Eastern Europe? Five million young boys conscripted. Do you know how many returned back? Very few. Most of them were killed. When the Russians took them prisoners, they just froze to death. Payback. It was terrible. 28 million people were killed in the Second World War. And when those young boys came back and in, in, the Russians came in, Stalin gave an order. He says, you can rape whoever you want. Payback. That's what they did to our girls. They killed them. You can do it. They don't know how many, but they think maybe up to two million German girls were raped. Tens of thousands of babies were born. I mean, no one talks about it. The historians don't dig into it, but it was a terrible, terrible suffering that the German people experienced. Innocent girls. But war is a devil. The devil in human nature comes to the fore to cause unbelievable evil. And uh, so, you know, the Napoleons of the world come and go, you know, from Alexander to Julius Caesar to Napoleon Bonaparte to Adolf Hitler to Joseph Stalin to Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, but they're all dead and their regimes end up collapsing and falling apart. But Jesus' regime keeps getting stronger. There's something like three billion of us across the world, nearly half the population of the world. There are Christians in every place on planet Earth, even the most hostile regimes. The reports we're getting back from Iran which is the most hostile regime. When those Ayatollahs are not nice people. One day, Ayatollah Khomeini in 1988 ordered the prisoners to kill 30,000 prisoners. They were all Iraqis during the war. Just shot them, just got rid of them. One day, level of evil that took place. The war in the Middle East was planned in Tehran, arming the Houthis arming Hamas, arming Hezbollah, arming groups in Syria, Iraq. If you follow what's happening, 
And now the Americans and British and Australians are bombing the living daylights out of the Houthi in, in uh, Yemen. Did you realize that? Submarine missiles, warships, our boys are over there as well, helping to, to monitor this thing. It's terrible. It's an evil regime to take this there. But you know what? Evangelism is occurring right under the nose of these crazies, these religious fanatics. Do you know who's doing it? Women. Where are they doing it? Around the kitchen table. I love women. They love talking. Women love talking. Women love eating. Women love meeting together. Men are not like that. They just... just. So the women, their neighbours, just come over here. They talk shit. Lead them to Christ. So all these thousands of micro churches, where are they meeting? In kitchen, around kitchen tables with people who've come to faith. There might be six, 10 people. Who's the pastor? I don't know. Jesus raises somebody up who's got a gift in the word. And, and so we've got hundreds of thousands of people coming to Christ through women. Hallelujah, isn't that great? Don't you love, don't you love the girls? Hey. The loudest clapper happens to be a Persian man in the church. In China. What an evil regime that is. Monstrous. It's a Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist regime. They've probably killed, we don't know how many people. Mao Zedong would be the biggest killer in the world. They estimate 80 million people died in his 22 years of ruling China. He didn't care if it was 100 million. He said that, 100 million, what's that? He was an evil man. The doctors that attended to him in his old age, he would, they would go and find the youngest, prettiest girls right across China and bring him into Mao's harem. He was an old man, wretched old man, married four or five times and he's just raping these girls. They didn't care, just this power corrupts, absolute power. He was a monster. And this present regime now is, is, is actually threatening and menacing. They threatened Australia the other day. Did you read it, the ambassador? If I was the prime minister, I'd kick the bum out and say, get back to China, you wanna offend Australia? He's threatening us. Are you going to be over the abyss? You know, like for crying out loud. Who do they think they are? Menacing. But you know, right under this evil, the Chinese people are not evil. They're beautiful. They're good people. This regime, right under their noses. You know how many Christians there are there? The government says 65 million. It's about 150 million. And the way it's growing, the way the demographers are sharing it, by 2050, it'll be 350 million. One in four people will be strong, practicing Christians. How can that evil regime survive with so many Christians praying and, 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 and exercising faith? Hey, their days are numbered as well. They're gonna come down like a house of cards. All of them, they all bite the dust. But Jesus is alive and his church is prospering and going throughout the world. And so don't take on board the hostile media in the West that says, oh, the churches are nothing. The church is, is powerful throughout the world. It's got a few rocky roads within the Western field, but it's growing in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Central America, Middle East. Amazing what's taking place. So here he says, the whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him for royal power, look at this, dominion, belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Hey, be encouraged. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship, but bow before him all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. Everyone is gonna to have to bow before Jesus. And I tell you, it's far better to do it now than to, be for, and to do it voluntarily than to be forced to do it when he returns because then it's too late. Resurrection to eternal life, resurrection to eternal death. Salvation is available to you today, here, online. Now is the time for you to bow your knee to Jesus. Today is your opportunity to respond to his offer of free grace, forgiveness for all your sins, and the gift of eternal life. 
I'm gonna lead you in a prayer in a few moments. If you haven't bowed your knee, I'd love you to do that. So this, this, this January 2024 is when I gave my life to Christ. I love this final little statement, he says. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. This is David from the pits of depression saying, wow, who's he talking about? He's talking about you. When Kath and I came here in 1978, we were 24 and 22 years of age. She was 24, I was 22. No babies, we produced four babies. And this morning in our song service, one of my grandchildren led the worship, Mia. And she's now leading the children's ministry over there. I mean, as a dad and as a granddad, and I'm sure Chris and Effie feel the same, we just, we're just think, oh, we're just so thankful. The unborn who have now been born, they're serving him. You've got grandkids. You've got children. Share the gospel with your grandkids. One of my grandchildren said to me, Papa, could you come up with a Bible reading plan for me? I want to read the whole New Testament in one year. Could you help me? To, oh, I thought, help her? Man, I'll work day and night to come up with a plan that's the best plan the world has ever seen for my granddaughter. The children out there, the, the breakout group that we're reaching these kids, these four at the front here who I tease all the time, they're really good kids. They're a little bit naughty at times, but don't worry, we fix them up. <laughs> they come from the community. They come from breakout, they come to youth and they come here and they hear my message and they tell me what God says to them through what I'm speaking. So afterwards you guys tell me what God's saying to you, okay? But there are thousands of children out there that need the Lord. There are unborn Children, we, we are called as a church to reach them. Um, I, I wanna be, this is my 46th year leading the church. I, I wanna be obedient to Jesus' call on my life. And if Jesus has called you to be a part of our church, then collectively, we need to be obedient to the call he placed on the Christian Family Center from Mother's Day 1976 when it was birthed, just a handful of teenagers and one person who was over 40. How's that? If we are faithful in the opportunities we have today, we'll be influencing the next generation and that's our greatest joy, to influence the next generation. So you wanna serve the Lord as Cass mentioned? You can serve on a Friday with the breakout kids. Some of these kids are wild, but they need Jesus. You can be bust them in, be your supervisor, just watch over things. Or be involved in our kids ministry or youth ministry or, or you wanna, work in the nursing home, see Val Grab. We must never forget the seniors. One of the best services I go to is the Friday morning. It's a fantastic service. It's a great service. I tweeted the other day. I said, 11 o'clock, here's our song leader, he's 95. Here's the pianist, he's 92. And there's a bunch of young people in their 70s assisting them and 80s. I mean, it's just amazing. Doesn't matter how old you are what sex you are, what background you've come from. You've been marked out by Jesus to serve his purposes and to, for us to be involved in reaching the next generation. The call of God is upon you in 2024. Realize you're not here just by accident to warm a seat, you're here to serve Jesus, to serve his church, to reach into the, the, the people that have yet to, to come to Christ. That's my prayer, can we stand together? Oh, Lord Jesus, you are good. Yeah, musicians come and you're gonna lead us in a beautiful song. As we stand in the Lord's presence, is today the day of salvation for you? If you're at home or watching this wherever you are, you stand as well. Maybe this is the day for your salvation. Now is the time. People just said, oh, I can wait till the next time. You're like, no. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you're saying, now's the time, today's the day, 
I can't force you, I, I can only lead you and, and you allow the Holy Spirit to open your heart and to save you as you yield to Jesus Christ. If you have not given your life to him and you're saying, I wanna give my life to him. I want 2024 to be with Jesus on the inside, not just out there. Whether you're here or online, will you pray this prayer after me? Just close your eyes and just say something like this. Say, Jesus Christ, I receive you as my personal saviour and master. Forgive me, Lord, of all my sins, past sins and present sins and any future sins. Help me to live for you. Empower my life through the Holy Spirit to rise above the tendencies to do the wrong thing. Empower my life. Change me. Fill me with your peace. Enable me to not just turn over a new leaf, but to see my, the orientation of my life change as I serve you and as I live for you. Jesus Christ, I confess you're Lord of my life. I bow my knee before you today. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, don't leave today without talking to one of our pastors or let us know on your Connect card to so that we'd love to make contact with you and to, to help you to understand what it's about. You may need to do the Bible formation program in February to learn the Old and New Testament. There's other things that we can do to help you. But for the rest of us, can we consecrate ourselves to outworking the call of God upon the Christian Family Centre? If God has called you here, even though you may not be around as long as I have been or Phil and Janet have been here two years before me, if He's called you here, you're part of that call. And He wants you to serve Him and to experience the great joy of, of serving. And in heaven, the people that come to faith are gonna be your welcoming committee. They're gonna say, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your giving. You're giving 140 plus thousand dollars last year to world missions. In Ghana, they're putting up the building of that one, the roof of that 1,000 seater. There's gonna be tens of thousands of people that come to faith. They've got a physical building through your generosity. You have, you have give, you, you're world Christians. And we're gonna do that more even this year. So we're serving Him. You're part of His program. Dedicate yourself afresh this year. Let me pray for you. Father, we dedicate ourselves to you. We say thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us into this church family. And like King David, in spite of our sufferings, in spite of our difficult times, we rejoice, Lord, that you are our saviour. You're our ever-present help. You're always attuned to our heart's cry. You're always there to support us and help us in the tough times as well as the good times. And Lord, help us to serve you through this church, to be a witness to our community, to give of our time and of our, of, of our talents and of our treasure to serve your purposes. Help us to find a place where we can serve within your community, your church. Bless us and may this year be an absolutely fabulous year in Jesus' name. Let's sing the song before hand back to Cass. Humble Bill. If you'd like to keep up to date with what's happening throughout the week at church, follow us through our various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed today's message or want to watch a previous one, you can head on over to our YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us and we can't wait to see you next week.